there's a lot of talk about scaling Bitcoin off-chain. Uh, don't you think that going that route will open it up to the challenges you've been talking about in terms of open and borderless platforms? Um, we would like to see as many Africans as possible using actual Bitcoin, but there is a challenge with user experience. And uh, other blockchains like Dash claim to be solving that problem. And as a result, you can see the past few days, uh, Dash has shot up like 400%. So how will Bitcoin evolve in a way that it will remain open, decentralized, and borderless? Thank you. That's a great question. I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding about what it means to do second layer technologies. Um, to use an analogy, it's almost as if a lot of people in this ecosystem are saying, we can't do TCP, we're too invested in IP. And I don't want to leave the IP space and start doing this second layer TCP stuff. TCP is IP, and second layer blockchain scaling solutions are Bitcoin. If you're doing Lightning Network, or using Tumblebit, or any of the other platforms that are being suggested as second layer channels for very rapid, high scale, low cost transactions between participants, what the participants are exchanging is Bitcoin transactions. Not only are they exchanging Bitcoin transactions, but these second layer technologies are fundamentally trustless. You do not need to trust the other party. You do not need to trust any of the hops in between in this routed network. Better yet, by keeping it off chain, you not only achieve scale, you achieve enormous privacy. Because these transactions are onion routed in such a way that every participant in the route only knows the previous hop and the next hop, and they don't even know if they are the source or destination. Second layer technologies offer us a way to scale dramatically, and they're not replacing on-chain transactions. They're magnifying the scale of on-chain transactions by a factor of a hundred or a thousand or even more. And so we will need to also scale on-chain transactions. Um, now, this is hard to do. And the reason it's hard to do on Bitcoin is because no one's in charge. And that's a feature, not a bug. If someone was in charge, they could make easy changes. But the consensus rules in Bitcoin act as a constitution that requires a super, super majority to modify. Especially to modify the fundamentals, where you won't find easy consensus. That is deliberate. If you had a system that could be modified with ease, then it would be co-opted and sold out, parceled up, chopped up, and turned into boring. There are a lot of alternative currencies or competing currencies that are claiming that they have the scalability problem solved. I am extremely doubtful of these claims. Because these scalability problems are not something you solve once. They are a matter of trade-offs. The fundamental trade-offs in Bitcoin are, can you do at scale trustless? Because you can do trusted third-party intermediary at scale easily. We already have that. It's called Visa. Well, when I say we already have that, I mean about three billion of us have that. The other four and a half billion, well, who cares? They didn't qualify. Why didn't they qualify? Precisely because of the third party trust. Right? Because things like KYC and AML mean economic exclusion and the poverty trap. So it's easy to say we can scale. The question is, can you scale without sacrificing the fundamental principle of trustless operation, decentralized operation, and neutrality? And that is a difficult answer. It is also the case that Bitcoin had no scaling problems in 2013. Anybody remember 2013, the golden days of zero-fee transactions and no scaling problems? Which is approximately the level of volume where Dash and Ethereum are today. It's like saying, look, my eight-year-old scored six goals in their junior league match, 
Kike only scored two in the previous FIFA match. My eight-year-old is rocking this soccer thing and is better than Kike. Different leagues, baby. <laughs> you don't have scaling problems until you have scale, right? You don't have governance problems until you have contentious governance issues and difficult trade-offs to make. So, it's easy to stand outside of the dance floor and say, I'm the best dancer. Get up and dance. And when you're trying to do it on a 15 to 19 billion dollar scale, then we'll talk about who's scaling and who isn't. These are not easy questions to answer, and they shouldn't be minimized uh, in this discussion, because there are very important trade-offs to be made. All right, let's take another question. In the future, right, do you see Bitcoin uh, consolidating as a, as a real digital asset, as a, a, as a medium to store value? Yeah. Uh, because given the rise the, of the altcoins, right, there is competition there, right? Which, yes. Which is fair enough, right? As you say, it's a free market. So yes, and, absolutely. And as such, uh, some of these uh, altcoins will probably be used for microtransactions, micropayments, right? Maybe. Because to, as of today, Bitcoin has one of, one of the issues with Bitcoin is the, the higher cost of transaction trade. Yes. I remember I transferred Bitcoin to myself the first time as a test. I transferred the equivalent of five US dollars, and the transaction fee was four US dollars, so it didn't make sense, right? Yes. Ah, okay. So I, I know that all the improvements on the on the software on the net are aiming at reducing these costs. But then, look, projecting into the future, how, how do you see the situation playing out? So first of all, you've got to understand there are no magic solutions here. So systems that are cheaper today are cheaper today because mostly they haven't been used to the same level as Bitcoin. And so having a robust global network is what makes it difficult to scale. When they have robust global networks and as many users as many transactions, what happens is they start to run into the same problems. They are following the same path. There is no magical other path full of daisies and unicorns and puppies where no problems exist. There are tough choices. Now they can make different choices. They can make choices like we'll keep transactions cheap, but cause the network to centralize so it's easier to control and apply censorship and corporate control over it. That's a choice that might be made, and those might be cheaper. But the more they do that, the more they become like PayPal and Visa. And guess what? We already have PayPal and Visa. They're far more efficient and will always be far more efficient, as long as they exclude three or four billion people from the economic system. That's not what Bitcoin is trying to do. So, I think Bitcoin is already showing it's very robust for store of value. It's very robust for censorship resistance. It's very robust for decentralization and maintaining the consensus rules. And we haven't really seen any of these systems be very seriously attacked from multiple very large organizations or governments. But we will. That will happen. And so we'll see if Bitcoin can survive that. Um, but I think it can also be a medium of exchange with technologies like Lightning Network. Um, it's not so easy to do these things. It appears easy. In 2013, Bitcoin transactions were cheap and fast, and everybody loved everybody in the community, and there were no disagreements. And a lot of the other systems, the open blockchains, are going through that same period. But as they try to get bigger, and they run into these difficult questions of how do we scale without compromising the principles, disagreements come up, and the community is no longer so happy. And then, when you have disagreements, you have governance problems. Um, so, you know, I'm not afraid of competition. This is a wide-open ecosystem, and every one of these open blockchains is making different choices, and these choices make it more or less suitable for different types of applications. So let us compete. Um, the nice thing is that the entire ecosystem of cryptocurrencies is growing very, very fast. Um, and they're feeding innovation off each other, so it's a very exciting time. Um, you know, there is one class um, of currencies that is not innovating at all, and that's national currencies. <laughs> they stopped innovating in uh, 1650, approximately. 
And since then, really not much innovation, right? Yeah, okay, so the, it's polymer now instead of paper. Woohoo! <laughs>